Good morning. My name is Mrs. Whiteley and I'm here today to do your chapel with you. And I hope you um, are going to have a really good day. And I hope God's going to bless you abundantly. Well, a lot of you may know me and a lot of you may not. So I thought I'd introduce myself. I taught at CCA for 23 years. I mostly taught second grade. And I also taught kindergarten for a few years. And I taught fourth grade and fifth grade. And once in a while, I would teach first and second grade. So I kind of went all over in the elementary wing, but I enjoyed every year I was there. And I really enjoy being around kids. And some of you might have seen me last year at CCA because I come in in the afternoons and tutor. Uh, so that's what I do. I come in and tutor after school with a few of you. And I really enjoy being around children because they have taught me a lot. I feel like I learned as much from a child as they learned from me. So that's my um, take on kids. So I'm glad to come to this morning to teach you a few things. Mostly, the thing I want to teach you this morning, which is really something you all know anyway, is that God looks at people in their hearts. He doesn't look at the outside and say, oh, they have nice clothes, so I should like them more. And God doesn't love us more or less based on our clothes or the color of our eyes or the color of our hair or if we had a bath or if we didn't have a bath or say, for instance, sometimes we as people do that. We'll look at somebody and go, wow, their clothes are kind of really, you know, not very good or they need to take a bath. They haven't taken a bath in a long time. And then we judge them thinking, oh, they must be poor or they must not be very nice. And really, that's really wrong. And I know that it's easy to do. But we have to keep reminding ourselves that that's not the way God looks at us. And there's times when we might be looking terrible. But that doesn't make us a terrible person. And that's not what God sees in us. He sees our heart. He sees how we live and how we treat other people. And here's a Bible verse I want you to look at. I'm going to cover my face so you could see it. Let me pull it up there. I'll cut it back away. There we go. God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. 1 Samuel 16, 7. Maybe you could read that with me. Can you see it good enough to read it with me? God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at at the heart. 1 Samuel 16, 7. So don't forget that God's looking at your heart. He looks at how you treat other people. And that's how we need to remind ourselves all the time that God's looking at us in a different way than we look at each other. Um, and sometimes things seem to us a certain way, but really it's kind of like on the surface, it looks just like nothing's going on. So on a surface, you look at the water or the ocean. On the surface, it just looks like water. Maybe there's some boats on the water. Maybe there's a log floating in the water, or you could see some seaweed. But you know, because you've seen pictures, the whole there's a whole other world underneath the ocean, right? So that on the surface, you just think, just a bunch of water out there. But underneath that surface, there's a whole lot different. And it's kind of like our surface. Our surface is our outside, how our clothes look, how our hair looks, how um, we treat each other. But you don't know that even people, how they act, that's still a surface thing. You don't know what's going on in people's lives. Like what's in their, what's at their house? Um, did they have breakfast? Maybe their parents didn't have enough money to buy food for breakfast. Maybe their parents are having a real struggle. And so the kid comes to school or your friend comes to school and they're grumpy. Maybe the, there was something that happened on the way to school. Sometimes you have to realize and give everybody a chance and say, you know, instead of being grouchy back to somebody that's grouchy, be nice back to them. Because you don't know what's happening underneath the surface. Because the surface is the only thing you're seeing. You're seeing their attitude. You're seeing their grouchy face. And you don't know what's going on. So I'm going to tell you a story about a man and his neighbor and a field. A field was just, you know, he, he was a farmer, so these people planted crops. And this happened a long time ago, like um, 80 years ago. 
It was during World War II when this happened. And this wasn't anything to do with the war. It happened to do with two men that lived really kind of in the same area. And they both had tractors. And they both had plows hooked to the tractor. I'm going to show you a picture of that too. So this is what they both had. Something like this. This is, this is like a 1940s tractor I'm showing you here. So, you know, there's the tractor part here. And then the plow is back here. That This is what plows up the ground. And so this man and his neighbor both had this. And what they would do is they got hired to plow fields. Not everybody can afford a tractor and a plow, but that's what they did for a living. So one day, the one man, his, we're going to call them two, these two guys, Ford, that's their name, Mr. Ford, and Mr. Fletcher. But I'm just going to call them Ford and Fletcher, so I don't have to say Mr. every time. Ford and Fletcher sometimes would give each other work. Say Mr. Fletcher was really busy and he had Monday through Friday, he was going to be busy plowing fields. Well, somebody called him up and said, could you come plow my field on Wednesday? And he would say, no, but I could maybe go talk to Mr. Ford and maybe Mr. Ford could do it. Then you'd have your field plowed on the day you needed it. So one day, Mr. Ford came down to Mr. Fletcher's house and said, I have a man that called me. He wants me to plow his field, but I'm already busy. Do you have time to do it tomorrow? So Mr. Fletcher said, sure, I have time. I wasn't scheduled to go anywhere. So he goes, takes his tractor and drives it down the road very slowly. I don't know if you've ever been behind a tractor. They can't drive very fast. And I'm sure back then they had to drive even slower. So they, um, Mr. Um, Fletcher took his tractor and drove down the street to this field. Now, Mr. Ford wasn't very far away. Maybe he was um, a half a mile away plowing somebody else's field. They were both working. It was a really cold winter day. Very, very cold. And uh, the wind was blowing. I don't know about you. I don't like the wind anyway, but I really don't like it when it's blowing and it's cold. So Mr. Fletcher had to bundle up with lots of layers of coats and gloves. And he had done a thing that's kind of cool, I think. Let me show you this picture of this tractor again to show you what he did. So what he had did, what he did, which is kind of cool, right here's the, you know, the tractor and here's the plow. He had somehow rigged something underneath here that was like a stick so that when he's plowing, if this bumps something like a big rock under the ground or bumps any kind of um, hard object, rather than break something on his tractor or break something on his plow, that stick was somehow would disconnect the plow from the tractor so that he'd have to just stop what he was doing and go out and inspect what he'd hit. I think that's good. I think that's pretty smart. I don't know if that is something they do today, but this day he was digging. Um, the guy told him, I want you to plow the ground. It wasn't really digging. He was plowing it, you know, just turning it underneath like a rototiller would. He said, I want you to go a whole foot deep. Now, a foot is as long as a ruler. You know how a ruler is but is 12 inches. That's how deep he had to go from the top of the ground down. So that's kind of deep. And um, the farmer asked him to do that because he was going to be planting beets. You know beets, those red vegetables? Some of you probably don't like those. I didn't like them when I was a kid, but I like them now. Um, so he was digging pretty deep in the ground, not just the top. He wasn't just rototilling the top. He was going way down deep. So this stick that was he had hooked was pretty deep too. So he knew that if something, if the thing came apart, the plow from the trailer, he knew that the tractor there was a something there was a problem under the ground. So he was plowing away. Then all of a sudden, boom! Things came; those two came apart, and he knew I've hit something, and I need to check out what I hit because as a um, you don't want to ruin your equipment if you know anything about big. Farm equipment is expensive, and even 1940 it was expensive. So he um, got out. He knew right where the stick had, you know, made things come apart. So he got a shovel and started digging. And he looked down there and he kept thinking, "I don't see anything. I don't see anything." But there's got to be something because the stick doesn't. The stick was taking the two parts of his equipment apart. Anyway, as he dig down a little further with his shovel, he felt something. 
something hard. He thought, oh, must be a big boulder or a big rock or a piece of concrete. He didn't know. And then he saw something kind of down there that was a shiny or metal. It didn't look like a rock. It was more like an object, something. So he went and got um, a little deeper and dug down there. And then he realized, huh, this is weird. I, I feel like I could see something down there that looks kind of like a big plate or like a big, you know, like a big platter. You know, that's just, that's just weird. So he walked the half a mile to where Mr. Ford was doing a field and, and yelled at him, got his attention and probably waved and said, Hey, and so he stopped his tractor and they went and talked together. He says, come, I need you to come look at this hole that, um, where I dug and I want you to come look and see what's going on. I want you to help me. So they both got over there with their shovels and started digging around and being careful not to break anything because they knew that this was not just a rock or a piece of concrete. This is something maybe important. I don't know. So they started digging and they came up. Whoa, this is actually like plates, like regular, not a plate like we think of, like, you know, like a dinner plate, but something really fancy. Like if your mom baked like special Christmas cookies or special, you know, like had a platter with cheese and crackers and she made something really fancy for like guests, this would be the kind of plate she'd serve it on. Something very fancy and pretty. Those are the special dishes your mom had. Well, there was one of those. Of course, they were full of like dirt and mud and gross. And they were trying to just use their hand to wipe them off. But it was pretty big. It was really big. It was a, like, a, like I said, a big plate, big serving tray. And then they kept digging. They found another one. And they found another one. And they found another one. And like, this is crazy. And then they found like, like these bowls and this like serving thing where you could put something in it had a lid. They found spoons, silverware, like, you know, real silverware. And they, they just kept looking and finding. And eventually they dug out of that hole 34 pieces of something that, you know, plates, not just rocks, 34 pieces of something, a buried treasure, basically. Um, and the other guy, Mr. Fletcher, Mr. Ford said, oh, I remember hearing that 2,000 years ago, the Romans used to live in this area of England. That's where they were at. And that 2,000 years ago, you know, things get buried after 2,000 years, way deep in the ground. And maybe this is their stuff, uh, something from them. Well, that's exactly what it was. But they didn't know for sure what they had dug up. Well, Mr. Um, Fletcher is the one that had found it because his tractor is the one that had um, bumped and his tractor had come apart. And the rule back then was if you find anything that's like really, really precious or could be worth a lot of money, if you sold it to a museum, you are the one that's going to keep it and you're the one that gets to get paid for it. So that was kind of cool. So Mr. Fletcher could have kept all that stuff and um, turned it into like, I don't know, somebody that's at the museum or somewhere where they would collect that kind of stuff. But Mr. Um, Ford was a little tricky. He thought he could be sneaky, and he was. He just asked Mr. Fletcher, hey, do you care if I take all this stuff? Because I don't think it's worth anything. And I'm willing to take it, and I'll grab all that stuff and stick it in my wooden box here, and I'll just take it home and keep it. And look, I'll look into it for you if you don't mind giving it to me. Well, Mr. Um, Fletcher said, fine, you go ahead, you take it. I, I don't really know what to do with it. And I'm not really that interested in it. See, Mr. F Mr. Ford knew that you can get money from it, but Mr. Fletcher didn't. Mr. Fletcher was just a hardworking man with a plow and a tractor. And he didn't know anything really about that. But Mr. Mr. Ford knew that if this was valuable, he could turn it in and he could pay it. But the rule was whoever found it first, doesn't matter whose field it belonged to, doesn't matter which tree that tree was at, if you found something special like that, it's kind of like that saying, finders, keepers, losers, weepers. It was the thing that you got paid. If you found it, you get the money. And Mr. Ford knew that, but he didn't tell Mr. Fletcher. He just acted like, this is just a bunch of muddy, dirty plates and stuff, so... Here, I'll take it off your hands. I'll go home and I'll clean it. So that's what happened. He went back to his field with this box of treasure. 
and Mr. Um, Fletcher started, filled up the hole and started doing his plowing again and got done and plowed the farmer's field that was asked to. And he went home and the next day he got paid for that. And that was the end of that. He didn't really think much more about those things they found. Now, Mr. Ford, on the other hand, he got home and he got those plates out of that box and he cleaned them and cleaned them. And the more he cleaned, the more he saw, wow, this is not just like some old yucky looking metal thing. It was like pure silver, or gold or copper. It was beautiful. And I'm going to show you some pictures so you can see them. And then you'll know that the stuff he found was amazing. But it, of course, it doesn't look amazing when it's covered in mud and dirt and has bits and pieces of rocks on it and roots and who knows what it had. It was 2,000 years sitting under the ground over a foot deep or about a foot deep. So I don't know why, even though Mr. Fletcher knew, um, I mean, not Mr. Fletcher, sorry, Mr. Ford knew that that was worth something, of course. He decided to just kind of keep it quiet and put it in his shed. Like, uh, maybe if I keep it a little bit longer, it will be worth more money if I wait. And there's that's true about some things. Some things get of more value. So you wait later, 10 years, it's going to be worth more. Well, that's kind of what he did. He, it doesn't say in the story why he kept it longer. He just did. And he kind of hid it away. Nobody knew he even had it. And Mr. Um, Fletcher never asked him about it or talk to him anymore about that. Well, one thing he did wrong though, and you know, it's kind of like when you judge people by the surface, by what they're wearing or how they look or how they act, you're going to always pretty much get it wrong because you don't know. Well, Mr. Um, Ford thought, I'm going to hide it. But the thing he did wrong was he had one spoon that was kind of cool. He really liked that spoon. Maybe it was fancy. I don't know, like one of those fancy spoons. He put it on top of his mantle. So he stuck it up on the mantle. And every so often, he'd take it down and look at it and think, wow, this is so awesome. Wow. Then he'd put it back up there. Well, one day, there was a knock at the door. And Mr. Um, Ford went and answered it. It was this friend of his who was a doctor. And this doctor was um, not there for a doctor's visit, just there to visit him. And the doctor and him were talking about just stuff, like friends do. And then the, the doctor walked over by Mr. Ford's uh, mantle. And he kind of looked up there and saw something shiny. And he's like, what's this? This spoon? Where did you get this? And he kind of gave some, oh, I don't know, I found it one day when I was digging. I don't know, just a, it's just a spoon. He tried to act like it's no big deal. It's just some old spoon that I found that I thought was cool. Well, eventually the doctor got it out of him that this was not just an old spoon, that this was part of a whole set of 34 things that were found way down in the dirt that day by Mr. Um, Fletcher. And so the doctor said, you know, you're supposed to turn that stuff in. You, that belongs, anything like that is a value. It has to be turned in. It can't be, you can't keep it. And he could Mr. Fletcher couldn't have kept it either. But Mr. Fletcher wouldn't have probably kept it had he known. He would have just he he would have turned it in had he been the one in possession. So Mr. Fork, the doctor said you should you need to turn it in. And I'm not sure exactly how it happened, but eventually the official people from the museum or the government came to Mr. Ford's house and say, We understand that you have 34 items that are old, like two thousand years old, and you need to turn those in. And I, we need to look at them and see them. So he walked out to his shed, got the box, brought it in the house and gave it to the museum. And they looked at it and they, you know, cleaned it even maybe more. And then they realized by, comp I don't know how, I don't know how they do this stuff, but they can tell like from who brought it, what, like how many years old, it was from 400 BC. So it was like 400 when it was like the year 400. And so they could tell, they could tell who made it because of the style it was in and who designed it and how old it was. And it was worth, you know, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. So they went back over to Mr. Um, Ford's house to tell him 
that that stuff was of value and that he um, was going to get paid. And he, he did at that time say, well, Mr. Fletcher's actually the one that found it, but he didn't really want it, which is not really true. It's like he kind of made a little bit of a lie up about it. So they wrote down on their notes that Ford and Fletcher were like both owners of that stuff. But since they hadn't turned it in, it's kind of like, it's kind of like the difference between when your mom asks you about something you did that was naughty and you just come out and tell her or your mom finds out about it another way. That's different. See, if you just say, yeah, I did that. I was wrong. Or go to your mom before she even talks to you. Just say, hey, mom, sorry. I um, I kind of got into your purse because I wanted a candy at the store and I got a dollar out of there. Um. I'm sorry. Here's the here's a dollar of my from my piggy bank that I'm going to pay you back, and I won't go in your purse anymore. But he didn't do that. Mister Ford had hidden that stuff all that time, so the museum though was still decent with him. They could have given him a fine, and I think today there might be a fine associated with hiding stuff. And this, like I said, was during World War II. Well, World War II was over by the time this stuff got found, and um, it was 1946 now. And they came back with a thousand dollars or a thousand pounds, which is how they, that's the money in Britain is pounds. They call it pounds. They gave him a thousand pounds and then they went over to Mr. Fletcher's house and gave him a thousand pounds also because they felt like that was fair for him finding it and for Mr. Ford actually having it. Well, the thing of this story is that, like I said, we don't know what's under the surface of things or the surface of people. But the thing is, had Mr. Fletcher kept those things when he found them and put them in a box and took them home, he's the kind of guy that would have been, a, been the honest guy and he would have said, I need to turn these in. And guess what? Had he turned them in when he found them, even if they were probably dirty, had he turned them in without somebody finding out about it after, he would have got between a half of a million pounds to a million pounds because that was what the value of that was back in 1940, like say 42, when, when he um, first hit them with his tractor. But he didn't know what the value was and the other guy did, so he kind of was sneaky. But they could have, they could have, or Mr. Fletcher could have had a million pounds, which is, you know, Think of a million dollars today, how much we could do with it. If you had a million dollars 80 years ago, it would be like five million or something like that today. So back to this Bible verse that God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. First Samuel 16, 7. Don't forget that God sees your heart and you can't fool God. You know, sometimes people I think think they can. They think, oh, I'll just act nice to everybody, but inside, I don't like that person. I don't like that person. And when they see somebody else, they'll say, oh, come over here. I want to tell you a little bad thing about so-and-so. So they're doing bad things and they think because they're whispering that that doesn't count. But you know, God knows what goes into our hearts. God knows what we're thinking. When the Bible talks about the heart, it's not like the heart has a bind. You know, it can't think. Bible means heart, it means your mind. So if your mind is thinking bad things about people and you don't like them, but yet every time you see them, you're all nice to them, God knows that you're just not being real. But you can change. You could change how you think. You could ask God to help you. You could have God... Remind you that we don't look just at the surface. We don't just look at the ocean and think of the ocean anymore. Like, oh, there's just a bunch of water. We don't look at a pond and think there's some water or the river. Or now I'm going to not think of looking at dirt the same. But there's buried treasure somewhere in this world. And a lot of them even haven't been found. And there's a lot of people that go searching for them because they know they're there. Like in the ocean, there's sunken uh, ships from a long time ago with has gold and silver and that stuff in them. Once in a while, they find them. And they're re really wealthy when they get that. 
But God always sees what's below our surface. Our surface is just the outside of us. But God sees what's inside of us, what we think, how we think, and how we treat other people. Even if we think we're being quiet and we're sneaky, that's not going to work with God. It never does. So just remember, there's something underneath the surface of other people that you don't know about. You don't know their home life. You don't know their if they're hungry. You don't know if their family is really poor and if they're struggling. And especially now with this um, COVID, a lot of people struggle from having to be out of work or having to be home all day with 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 everything. They don't get a chance to be out as much as they used to. So people sometimes act different. I've seen a lot of things on the news that are very weird, I think, that people are screaming, yelling at people that aren't wearing a mask. I know you're supposed to wear a mask, but not everybody, maybe you forgot it. I don't know. But to go up to a person and just scream at them and yell at them over that, they're basically not acting normal. A normal person doesn't do that. But you don't know what's going on in that person's life. They may have had a horrible day. And so we have to just, no matter what they do to us, we need to return it with kindness. So, and if you've ever tried that, it's kind of hard, but it's kind of interesting because if a person on the surface is acting ugly and acting mean, and you turn around and go, hi, how are you today? Can I, can I like, I don't know, buy you a coffee if you're a grown up? Or, <clears throat> um, how was, you know, how are you doing today? Or, is, you know, you want to talk about anything? I don't know. Just do something nice back instead of doing a bad thing back. And I think that's what we want to do. Somebody hits us in recess or pushes us in the line. We want to push them back, don't we? We want to get even. We want to even the score. But like I said, you don't know what's under the surface. So remember that what's under the surface is not so much what you would know. Always remember that under that surface of your life, God knows what's in your heart too. And it's how you treat other people that will help you be a better person. So don't forget about this treasure. It looked just like a big old field with dirt that he was plowing. But under there was a million dollars or a million pounds worth of treasure in those 34 items. So remember that. So let's have a word of prayer and help God to remind us and he will remind you, because if you ask him to, he will, that we want to treat people differently than maybe we've been treating them. All right, so let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this day, and thank you for each other. May we treat each other very kindly and nicely, because under the surface of all of us is our hearts and our love and our sadness. And sometimes those things are just really hard for us, and our life is really miserable. So help us. That if someone comes up to us and does something mean or acts like they're just mad, that we can turn around and treat them like maybe we could see through them and see the sadness and try to encourage them and try to be nice back instead of being ugly back. And that we can always have your heart because Jesus, people were mean to you and you always treated them nicely. You didn't do the things back to them like they did to you. And we want to be like you. So help us to be that kind of person. In your name we pray, amen. Okay, guys, have a nice weekend. Thank you for letting me share chapel with you today.